Hey guys, great to see you. The lights are bright. I can't see most of you, but my eyes will adjust to that. Hey, how many of you watched the All-Star Game? Some of you say, what All-Star Game? The baseball All-Star Game. Uh, I didn't get to see all of it, but I saw a little bit of it. I got to see near the end, and guess who they brought in? Manuel Rivera. What's he called? The closer. And guess what? He came in, and the final score was three to nothing. He shut him down. The closer. Isn't it interesting that in the greatest stakes of all, the stake of eternity, what happens to us and what happens to your friends that closing the deal isn't up to you. Because guess what? If it was up to us, a lot of us would fail. God has made that up to Him. And we're going to talk about that this morning and talk about this unbelievable partnership we have with God. Here's a question. How do you win the world to Christ with a minimum of fuss and bother? Good question. Let's take a look at our scripture passage this morning taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. If not, it'll be up on the, on the screen. Who is Apollos and who is Paul that we should be the cause of such quarrels? Why? We're only servants. Through us, God caused you to believe. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. My job was to plant the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it, but it was God, not we, who made it grow. The ones who do the planting or the watering aren't important. But God is important because He's the one who makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work as a team with the same purpose, yet they will be rewarded individually according to their own hard work. We work together as partners who belong to God. You are God's field God's building, not ours. Now I want to talk to you about this whole subject this morning and I'm going to give you six points and we're going to go through them rather quickly. If you're worried about taking a lot of notes, don't worry about it. Jennifer's going to put the PowerPoint up on our website and you can get all the details up there, okay? A daunting task given to us. Jesus said, I want you to change the world. Change the world. Look what Mark 16 says. Go into all the world and give the good news to who? Everyone. everyone. Do you know what everyone means in Greek? Yeah, everyone. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Go into all the world and give the good news to everyone. Christ gave us the chat task of changing the world. Well, the question comes is how are we doing? Well, let me give you a context of that. Do you know that there are 16,000 new people born every hour? While we're here during this hour, 16,000 people are going to be born. Wow. But here's something else that's very interesting. Do you know that during this hour, 17,000 people will become Christians? Is anybody awake out there? Do you know that Christianity is the only faith in the world that is growing faster than population? Amen. Come on, give God some praise. That's amazing. Right now, 2.8 billion of the 7.1 billion people in the world are Christians. That, by the way, is the largest religion Christianity is the largest religion in the world by 13 percentage points. Nobody else is even close. Christianity has the largest number of followers anywhere in the world. Now, here's some interesting things about that. Do you know that Christianity is also the faith by which more people are martyred for their faith than any other? This last year, 165,000 people were killed for their belief in Jesus Christ. Killed. 
While we're in this service, folks, 20 people will give their lives for the cause of Christ. 20 people every hour are martyred for the name of Christ. When Jesus said they will persecute you, they will kill you, they'll throw you in prison, it's going on all around the world. Right now, of the 2.1 billion Christians, 600,000 of them are being actively persecuted. Such as, if you share your faith, you'll be thrown in prison and they won't, will throw away the key. That kind of active persecution, we are constantly hearing in places like China, places in Africa, places in communist countries and Muslim countries, where pastors are summarily killed because they stand up and will not deny the name of Christ. I've got a picture that is literally, literally too graphic to show you here in church. Remember, I think I showed it to you, James, before. It was actually a pastor in Africa, in a Muslim area of Africa that has been taken over by the Muslims in Africa, who was literally buried up to his neck in the ground, told to renounce his faith. And I actually have the pictures of them taking up stones and stoning him to death because he would not renounce the name of Christ. In the continent, which is more Christian than any other continent in the world, there is active persecution of the Christian faith. Well, what's going on? In North America and in Europe, Christianity is in decline. In the United States, church attendance has gone from 43% of our population to 28% in the last 10 years. In Europe, the church is not a voice in culture, it's an echo of the past. But all the rest of the world, all around the world, the church of Jesus Christ is growing because people there have understood this unique partnership they have with God to change their world. Well, why is Christianity so important? Why is Christianity so important and what can we do about it? Do you know that there is nothing better, nothing better for a country than for more of its citizens to become Christians. Just think about this. In Covina, if more people became Christians, would, be, would there be more crime or less crime? If more people became Christians, would there be better marriages or worse marriages? Okay, do you want me to keep going? Do you get the point? There is nothing better. If you don't like the direction America is going, win people to Jesus, it'll make it better. There is nothing better for the culture than more people becoming Christians, becoming Christ followers. There is a great book, it's called The Growth of Innovation, or The History of Innovation. And it checked from the time of the Reformation, around the 1600s, and it pointed out in the last 400 years, the primary growth of innovation in our culture has been fueled by the growth of Christianity. If you go back to the major universities, Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, uh, Columbia, do you know that they were all started as Christian seminaries? All of them. The great universities of Europe were all started as Christian institutions. The greatest innovation has come. If you look at the countries, and I'm not heaping condemnation, but if you look at the countries that are most retarded technologically they're the countries where Christianity is the weakest. And the, this uh, uh, author, who is not a Christian, pointed out that innovation has been fueled by Christianity. Shouldn't surprise us, our God is a creative God. Our God is a creative God. I'll give you a couple of other things. Christ made a promise. The promise is, if you will believe in him, he'll change your world. And guess what? When you do, he does. When you trust Christ, everything, everything changes. What did Jesus say to us in this text that we read? He commanded us to go. He told us what to do. Proclaim the good news. He gave us the scope of the task. He said, give it to everyone. Tell the whole world. And he promised he'd go with us to aid us in the task. And he said the gates of hell would not prevail against it. He said, change the world.
The second thing that I want you to do is I want to talk to you about this unbelievable partnership. The scripture teaches us that we are co-laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Here's an interesting thing if you want to understand it. Very few people come to Christ the first time or the first way they hear the gospel. Let me illustrate that to you. This is very simple to understand. How many of you are conscious of the fact that the first time you ever heard the gospel, you accepted Christ? Put up your hand. One, two, three, four. How many of you heard the gospel over and over again and in a variety of different ways and then you accepted Christ? Put up your hands. Come on, look at that. For the majority of people, becoming a Christian is hearing the gospel over and over again and in a variety of different ways. It is a process. It's a process. And here in the scripture text that we read, there's the imagery of farming. You plant a seed, you sow a seed, you nurture that seed, you water it, and you wait for harvest time. You don't plant a seed and then go dig it up to see if it's growing. Okay? We just planted some rhubarb seeds. You know, when I go outside and I look at it and I'm asking the question, is it growing? But I don't dig it up to see if it's growing. I keep watering it. In fact, my wife reminds me, have you watered it today? Have you watered it today? That's what happens because we know there is time between planting and harvest. It's a process. So what should your concern and my concern be right now in this unique partnership we have? We should, listen, we should in each moment be more concerned about being the missing link in the chain that leads people to Christ than being the final link. We should be more concerned about being the missing link than the final link. The reason we get so paranoid about evangelism is we keep thinking we've got to be the final link. And guess what? The final link is God's business. The missing link is our business. Let me say that again. The missing link is our business. The final link is God's business. Then he goes on and he talks about, the third thing we want to talk about is an amazing empowerment and that is the power of the Holy Spirit. Look what Acts 1.8 says. But when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you'll receive power and you will tell people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Look what it says. You will receive power and you will tell people about me. Okay? Let me just help you understand something and I'm we're gonna I'm gonna go into some stuff here that I don't want you to get spooked with me so hang with me this is not gonna get weird okay the primary reason for the empowering of the Holy Spirit is so that we might be effective in our witness okay that's the primary reason those of you who come from a Pentecostal background the primary reason for the filling of the Holy Spirit is not so that you can speak in tongues there is nowhere it's taught in Scripture. The primary reason for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is so you could be effective in your witness. Why? Jesus said, he, listen to what, uh, remember Pastor James talked about fear? Listen to this. God has not given to you the spirit of fear. Do you know why? Fear comes from the devil. He has not given you the spirit of fear, but the spirit of fear. Power. Power. The spirit of power. What's the spirit of power? Come on. Talk to me. It's the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit's power, you've got the spirit of fear. If you've got the Holy Spirit in your life, you do not have fear because that perfect love casts out fear. Somebody with me here? Okay, folks, he's not the Holy Spook. He's the Holy Spirit and he gives power. Look what Jesus says. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, when you hear the, see the Holy Spirit 
descending and resting on someone. He is the one whom you're looking for. He is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now let me give you a quick primer on the Holy Spirit and on baptism. There are three kinds of baptism mentioned in the scriptures. One is water baptism. That's when a believer baptizes another believer in water. You all know, understand that one, right? You've seen our little horse trough up the front that we do that with. Okay? The second one is when you became a Christian, the Holy Spirit takes you and He baptizes you into the body of Christ. You become one with all Christians of all time and of all ages. That's what the Holy Spirit does when He baptizes you into the body of Christ. But there's a third kind that John is talking about here, that Acts chapter 1 is talking about, and that is when Jesus, the Lord of the church, says, I'm going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit so that you'll have power in your witness. That is not the same as being baptized into the body of Christ. It is a baptism of power that you get when you ask for it. It says... Jesus says, how much more shall he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? If you've never asked the Holy Spirit, Jesus, to baptize you in the Holy Spirit so that you might have power in your witness, that will explain why witness is so tough for you. Why you're so full of fear. Why you get so uptight. Why you get nervous whenever you're in contact with someone who doesn't know Jesus. Because you do not have that power. Why is this power so important? Well, first of all, you can't do it on your own. You just can't do it on your own. There's nothing inside the human psyche that can overcome the fear and anxiety that we have. Overcoming that fear is a God thing. It's, it's not a pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You don't even have boots on, folks. It is something God has to give you. And Jesus is building his church. And he will give you what you need. And he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit if and when you ask for it. And we, when we receive that empowerment, you and I become world changers. You and I become world changers. All right. Let me give you... Is this the fourth point? Good. You're with me. I'm going to give you the great relief. God gives the increase. God gives the increase. Look what 1 Corinthians chapter say. I want you to read with me when we get to the underlying part. I planted, Apollos watered, but God made the seed grow. So neither he who planted anything or he who watered, what? But God alone who is making the seed grow. God alone. God does it. Get over it. All right? So let me rethink evangelism. Got Elise and Gabby, are you here? I saw Elise. You guys are going overseas to work in a different culture and everything else. Here's something that's very comforting to you. When you go over, share Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results up to God. When you come back and people say, how many people did you win to Christ? You'll say, none. But Jesus sure won a lot of people to himself. Amen. See, that's the relaxing part. Share Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results up to God. Okay? What God does. Well, the first thing to know is the Bible clearly defines our role. We saw that in the text. We plant the seed and we water it or nurture it. I don't dig it up to see if it's growing. I water it and I nurture it. God alone makes the seed grow. God alone does that. Everything else, everything else in, in the process is up to God. He convicts people of their sin. He draws them to himself. He forgives. He saves. He justifies. He sanctifies. Everything else, God does. God does it. Just plant the seed and water it. Just plant the seed and water it. Do that in the power of the, that God gives you, the power of the Holy Spirit. Leave the results up to him and you'll find that it's amazing. And he 
is the great closer. He is the great closer. Now, let's go on and let's narrow it down. We've been talking about brave and you've heard the word oikos. But let me talk about this fact that we have in our lives a specific responsibility. It is our world or our oikos. And we're going to take a quick look at a, at a parable in the scripture. And you're going to see this. Let's read Matthew chapter 13, 24 to 30 and get the outline of the passage. There's another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But, but at night as everybody slept, his enemy came, planted weeds among the field. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's servants came and told him, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. An enemy has done it, the farmer exclaimed. Shall we put out the weeds, they asked. He replied, No, you'll hurt the wheat if you do. But let both grow together until the harvest, and then I will tell the harvest to sort out the weeds and burn them and to put the wheat into the barn. Now, let's take a look at this passage, the passage of the wheat and the tares. What you find in this parable is there are four elements in the parable. There's a planter of seed, there's a seed, there's a field, and there is an end result of what happens at the end of the process. We also find out in the passage that there's a good sower and there's an evil sower. Did you all see that in the passage we read? Yes. Now if we can fill in all the boxes of what each of those are, we'll understand it, right? Okay, let's try and do that. And fortunately, we don't have to guess. Jesus told us. This, this gets easy. Okay, so this isn't complicated. When they go into the house, it says they're leaving the crowds outside. Jesus went into his house and the disciples said, please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. All right, he said, I, the son of man, am the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world. The good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The harvesters are the angels. Just as the weeds are separated out and burned, so will it be at the end of the world. I, the son of man, will send my angels, and they will remove from my kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And they will throw them into the furnace and burn them. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the godly will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Anyone who is willing to hear should listen and understand. All right? Je Jesus gives us the outline, so let's fill it in the blanks. The planter of the seed and the good sower is the son of man. He's the sower. That's Jesus. The evil planter is who? The evil one or the devil. The seed, the good sower... What's he planting a seed? It says they're the children of the kingdom. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm a child of the kingdom. He's planting you and me. The evil sower are the children of the evil one. Anybody ever observed that when you're trying to be a witness to your friends and neighbors, the devil's got somebody there working as well? Oh yeah, oh yeah. How about the field? The field is the world. For both. The wheat and the tares are in the same field. The harvesters are the angels or the demonic angels. And the end result is everlasting glory or everlasting punishment. Now, I need to let you know that this is told, but this is not the primary meaning of the parable. The primary meaning of the parable is found here. That Jesus takes you, takes me, he plants us strategically in the world and he wants us to be faithful there till the end of time and then at the end of time he'll look at what has been harvested and bring it into his barn. Okay? Now watch this. Who is your oikos? You've heard Pastor James and uh, Pastor Rob use this term. Who is your oikos? I'm going to explain your oikos to you in a variety of different ways so when you hear the word used here at the church, you'll know what we're talking about. It's the 8 to 15 people God has strategically and significantly placed in your life. It is the people we know best and love the most. If you ask the question, who are the people that I don't want to go to heaven without, you'll know who your oikos is. They're the people you know the best and love the most. Okay, does that make sense? All right, it's the environment where Jesus has planted each of you. It's the place where you work. It's the neighborhood in which you live. It's the school in which you go. It's the people that are around you all the time, the environment. 
it is your circle of influence. It is the people that we encounter on a regular basis. If you're keeping running into the same person over and over and over again, such as at the, at the nail salon ladies or the hair salon or at the garage, you keep running into the same person over and over again, don't go, duh. Say, oh, God's put somebody into my life. Begin to develop the relationship. Pastor James was talking about that. It is, he's meeting parents, the same parents, every week where his kids play soccer. He's saying, well, these people need to be part of my oikos. I encounter them on a regular basis. And one more, it's the people that God brings into your life for a moment or a season. Let me give you an example of this. I was at the grocery store at Stater Brothers about three months ago, okay? And in front of me was a single mom towing along about three kids. And she came up to the counter and she had a whole bunch of food stamps that she was, you know, these coupons and things like that that she was getting, all the stuff for her kids. You know, and her kids are screaming and she's got milk and fruit and cereal and all the things the food stamps get. And she's got some stuff and she's six dollars short six dollars short not a lot and so she starts talking to the clerk that's there say well I'll have to find something to take out because I don't have enough food stamps to get the food I need for my kids and it was at that moment the Lord says God's brought this gal into my life at this moment I'm just standing in line behind her I said to the gal and I said to the uh, the wait the uh, clerk I said I'll pay the six dollars well, I said to her, I said, let me pay the $6 so you can have the food for your kids. I just want you to know that God loves you and so do I. And I want you to be blessed today. She started crying. Tears came to her eyes. I got to talk to the clerk and the clerk says, I've never seen anybody do that before. I says, there's something in my heart that when God brings people into my life, I have to do something. Why? Because the scripture says if somebody's hungry, what? Feed them. Somebody's hurting, help them. You see, those people become part of my oikos for that moment. They're the people that I can be Christ's hand extended at that moment. And why is that so important? Because oikos evangelism is God's natural method for transmitting a supernatural message. And at that point... I am becoming the missing link in the chain that leads a person to Christ, not the final link. Let me show you how this works. I've asked this question around the world to over, over 30,000 people. I've asked people why they became Christians, how they became part of the church. Some people say it was a special need. Other people say they just walked in, came on their own. Other people say it was a pastor or a staff person. Other people say it was a direct or indirect marketing. It might have been a poster you saw out on the, on the, by the bus stop, or it might have been our website, or something like that. But something like that draw, drew you here. Sunday school or small group, an evangelistic crusade, other programs, VBS uh, coming up, good, good thing, camps, other things, and friends or relatives. Well, how does it work out when you talk to 30,000 people and ask them the question? One to two, one to three percent of people with special need, two to four percent walk in, between zero and two percent for pastors, please pray for us. <laughs> uh, direct or indirect marketing, it's about a half to one percent. Sunday school or small group, four to six percent. Evangelistic crusades, half to one percent. All other programs, two to four percent. Here's the interesting thing. Friends or relatives, 75 to 90%. Let me ask the question. And I just want you to be straight honest. There's not, you're not going to get punished if you don't answer the question. How many of you could say the primary reason you're a Christian today is because of the influence of a friend or a relative? Stick up your hand. Look around, folks. Look around. Look around. That's the way it happens. It happens because we take seriously the people that God has placed into our world. These are real people you're going to look at. 
This is my church that I pastored in Mesa. The church itself had been going down for a period of three to four years, and we instituted the Oikos principle like Pastor Chad came here and did instituted it as the primary means by which we wanted to see the church grow. This is a story about a real lady. Her name is Velma. She's 71 years old. Velma lived in a senior, a senior park. And Velma had a young man from a gardening company that came and did her garden. And Velma heard this concept about Oikos and said, I can't do much, but I've got people that I know that I can plant some seed. And so she delivered her world. How did she do that? She reached out to a young man who was the gardener, Jose. He was her gardener. And she reached out to her granddaughter, Sandra. How many of you know, uh, are old enough to know that sometimes you can have more influence with your grandkids than you can with your kids? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So she reached out to her granddaughter, Sandra. Sandra reached out to her sister, and she reached out to her boyfriend, Chad. And she reached out to her uncle, Bob. Bob reached up, reached out to his son, Brett, and to Brett's son, uh, and to his daughter-in-law, who was Brett's wife, Kendra. Kendra reached out to her friend, Carol. Carol reached out to her friend, Vinny. They went to the gym together. Vinny reached out or Carol reached out, and Vinny was actually helping her, reached out to the personal trainer at the gym. They went to this guy every day, or every two or three days a week for training, and they reached Al, who was the trainer at the gym. Al reached out to his brother Vince. Vince reached his daughter, Tamara, and reached out to a guy he went to work with, Paul. Well, let's go down to Jose. Jose reached out to his uncle, his uncle Hector, and he also reached out to the boss, Richard. Now, I just stopped there. This web is still going. But remember the parable that Jesus said. He said, someone takes the seed and they plant it in their field. So Velma, her field is just here. But look at the way it grows. Remember when Jesus said, when you get to heaven, when you get to heaven, you've been faithful in little. He makes you ruler over much. Do you know that this man over here, Richard, oops, let me go back. This man here, Richard, never met Velma. But Velma will receive the reward for winning Richard to Christ. Because you see, Velma was by reaching her gardener, the missing link that won that person to Christ. Sometimes we will see the people that we sow the seed in come to Christ. Sometimes somebody else will lead them to Christ, but we've been that missing link, and Jesus makes it very clear. Those who sow and those who reap, those who water, they're all going to receive the reward. That's the way it works. Then he gives us this wonderful promise. It says he will be with us all the time and all the way. He'll be with us. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 28. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And note this last line. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of of the age. What about this promise? I want you to notice that this partnership power is conditional. This partnership power is conditional because the Lord told us to go and make disciples and he would be with us. Now some of the things we go and do, God doesn't go with us and God doesn't bless. Guys, go to a strip club. You won't experience the power of God or the presence of God. Okay? Get over it. He doesn't go there. You get involved with what God's involved in, and God will be with you. The issue is not that we get God onto our agenda. The issue, do we get onto God's agenda? 
When you get on to God's agenda, you'll find his power and you'll find his presence. You'll find he's with you all the time and all the way. And the one thing you and I can do to experience his power and presence is to share the gospel and we will always find he's there with us. And here's the good news. He's building his church. He is building his church and because of that, he will give you whatever you need and everything you need to reach your world for Christ. Let me wrap up and give you four things as we get ready to go home. Just four things. Number one, get focused. Get focused. Your oikos is your world and your responsibility. And your faithfulness to plant seed and nurture seed is your world delivered. Second, become empowered. We're going to have an invitation in just a moment. And one of the points of this invitation is very, very simple. If you never, if you, if you know you're paralyzed by fear, and you just seem, can't seem to get over it, and you need effectiveness in your witness, I want to tell you that you can come this morning. Our elders will be here. Our pastors will be here. And we will pray for you that the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon you, that Jesus would baptize you with power and that you will experience his power as you leave here, and your life will be different. The third thing is be real. Be real. There are only two reasons people don't become Christians. Number one, they've never seen a Christian. Number two, they have. Okay. If you try to share your faith and somebody said, you want me to live like you, you got a problem. Be real. And then number four, get busy. God has something that he wants to do through us today to become the missing link that will lead someone to Christ. 